Welcome to part four of topic two on polymer microstructures. In this part of the lecture we'll focus on how a polymer melt turns into polymer crystals based on thermodynamics. So remember that basically spherulites nucleate within a liquid much the same way that grains nucleate in a liquid metal. So that means we can apply similar thermodynamic principles to understanding the growth of spherulites that we use for metals. We begin with a simple case of homogeneous nucleation. In homogeneous nucleation, we start with a liquid polymer melt and then form isolated individual nucleates that then gradually grow with other nucleates being present and grow until they intersect one another and finally wind up with a completely spherulitic microstructure. So let's look at the thermodynamics of this case. First of all, we want to look at the change in free energy of the system. And thermodynamically speaking, the change in free energy of the system uh, has to be equal to, has to be at a minimum in order for the nucleation to proceed. We can calculate the free energy of the system as two forms, the free energy of the surface area of the spherulite and the free energy of the volume of the spherulite. Well, the surface area of the spherulite, its energy is equal to 4 pi r squared, which is the surface area squared, surface area of the spherulite, times the surface energy of the spherulite, plus 4 thirds pi r cubed, the volume of the spherulite, times the free energy change associated with creating the, this new crystal. Now, if we take the derivative of this change in energy with respect to the radius of the spherulite, we would expect the spherulite to become stable at a minimum minima in the energy, in this energy curve. So we can set that term equal to zero. So taking the derivative, we get 8 pi r c times gamma plus 4 pi r c squared times the change in free energy. Deriving this equation further results in a calculating the fact that the critical radius for nucleation is equal to negative 2 times the surface energy of the spherulite divided by the free energy volume of the spherulite. In other words, for very, very small nucleates, they will be unstable and for until they reach this critical nucleate size where the um, surface area of the nucleate no longer dominates the free energy volume and the free energy volume now reduces the energy more than the energy increase due to the surface area of the, the nucleate growing. Heterogeneous nucleation is slightly different. In this case we're assuming that as the lamellae form, they start from a single individual lamellae nucleate and then add on unit cells to each of the nucleates. So for example, here is a picture of several unit cells stacked up to each other. We have the first unit cell A with dimensions A, B, and L length in the lamellae direction. And then we add more unit cells up to N unit cells going in this uh, X direction or the A direction if you will. We have two surface energy terms. The surface energy of an edge, which is of course the AB plane of the orthorhombic unit cell, and then we have the face surface energies, which is the um, LA plane and the LB plane. First we compute the energy change associated with adding one more unit cell to a growing lamellae. So first, what is the energy change associated with a single lamellae? Well, it's 2B times L times the gamma of the face energy. So let's return to our picture. So we said it's 2 times B times L. So that's the area of this face times the face surface energy. Plus 2B times NA times gamma E. That's the surface area of the two edges here and down here times the edge surface energy. Plus the volume of the lamellae, B times A times L times N unit cells times the change in free energy, delta GV. Now if I wanted to make an additional delta G N plus one term, I would simply add N plus one to each of these two terms here. And if I subtract delta G N plus 1 from delta G N, I end up with 2 times A B gamma sub E plus A B L delta G V. 
So for this unit form cell to form, the energy difference between the nth and n plus 1 nth unit cell must be less than 0. So this term must be less than 0, it must be negative. That allows me to write the same equation as 2AB gamma E plus ABL delta GV is less than 0. And if I solve this for L, I find out there's a critical dimension L for the lamellae that must be greater than minus 2 gamma E over delta GV. In other words, it's the same thermodynamic term here as we had with the homogeneous nucleation. Only in this case, we're talking about the length of the lamellae in the C direction. From thermodynamics, we also know that the free energy change of the volume is related to the enthalpy and entropy change of the system, as given by this basic equation. We also know that at the melting temperature, the liquid and crystalline states represent equal energy, so delta G sub V is zero. If delta G sub V is zero, we can solve for the entropy of the system, the entropy change of the system, and that's equal to the change in enthalpy divided by the melting temperature. If I plug this term in for entropy, I get this equation here, which can then be solved and su suggests that the change in free energy of the system is equal to the change in enthalpy times the change in temperature divided by melting point. And this is what's important. It turns out that the critical parameter for forming a stable nucleate in a heterogeneous nucleation of a polymer melt is equal to minus 2 times the, surface en the edge surface energy of that lamellae in the growth direction times the melting point of the polymer divided by the enthalpy change of the system divided by the change in temperature. In other words, if I can cool the polymer melt below the melting point, I lower the size of the critical nucleate to form and make nucleation more likely. So let's take a look at some actual data. Here's the temperature plot where I have the melting point of the polymer and the glass transition temperature and we're plotting on the y-axis the spherulitic growth rate, or how fast the polymer nucleates and then grows. What we notice is that at temperatures just below the melting point, the spherulitic growth rate is relatively low. And the reason for this is that we have a low nucleation rate. The delta T term in this equation is too small, and therefore L sub C is large, and there are very few spherulites that will start nucleating and growing. As I get to lower temperatures, then the spherulitic growth rate increases dramatically, and I have my peak in spherulitic growth. The reason for this is that I have, a, I have a significant undercooling of the material below the melting point, and I have high levels of thermal energy to allow for movement of the polymer chains. As the temperature continues to decrease, I enter into a low diffusion rate area, where I have relatively low temperatures and therefore low thermal energy applied to the polymer molecules and they're less likely to be able to diffuse and move and form a crystal structure. Also notice that as the molecular weight of the polymer is decreased, the spherulitic nucleation rate increases. This makes sense because a lower molecular weight indicates a shorter chain and a shorter chain should have an easier time organizing themselves into crystal structures. Let's take a look at some actual data. So here we have polyethylene, which has a relatively high growth rate because it's a simple molecule, and therefore it has a rapid rate of diffusion and, and is able to nucleate readily. Notice also that it has a very high maximum crystallinity percentage of around 80%. By comparison, more complex polymers such as ter polyethylene terephthalate